Lou, how's it going? I, oh, good, good. He goes, is it cold up there? I said, oh, it's terrible. He goes, what's the temperature? I go, 10 degrees. He goes, I got to get off the phone. <laughs> he couldn't even talk to me if it's 10 degrees up here. Never mind, come up here. <laughs> it just cracked me up, man. Oh. I've made a paper pattern of the transom that we're going to build here out of some rosin paper and some blue tape. And I've transferred the dimensions from the model here onto that pattern. And uh, I've, I'm going to use a scale rule here to show you that this transom is six feet across from chine to chine at this level. It's got six inches of dead rise at that point, and uh, it's six feet nine inches across from uh, at the gunnels, and it's about three foot four inches tall. So we've transferred these dimensions onto that pattern. And now I'm just going to show you quickly the pattern. I, I had to use a pattern so that I could lay it out on each layer to get these layers all cut the same size. And uh, I'm going to move that back. Now this is right here. You're looking at the very inside layer of the transom. And obviously it's in layers and there's six layers here. Now the thing I would like to show you is the layers, the inside and the outside layer are going to go straight across, perfectly straight across the boat, but you can see that the inside layers have got a little bit of a biasness to them. And then I'm going to remove another layer, and you can see that the next layer down is angled in the other direction. So what you've got is your two cover layers, the outside layer and the inside layer, going straight across, and the four inside layers being on diagonals. So it's not like you've got it 90 degrees to itself like plywood, but it does have a little biasness to it. It creates a much more rigidity in this direction, but certainly all the grain is traveling straight across so that it uh, creates a rigidity across the thing, and that's exactly what we're looking for. Now, just this, these layers are white oak. It's well seasoned for gluing, and uh, some of it's a little quartered, and then some slabs on. It gives it a little bit of a character look so that it doesn't just get generic and just be quarter sawn all the way across. That's the idea. Now the first thing to do when vacuum bagging something like this is to lay down a sheet of plastic because you wouldn't want to try to vacuum bag right down to the plywood. It just wouldn't work out. Not that air would go straight up through the plywood, but it could get around the edges easier. So the plastic makes it so that you can fold it over and all that. You'll see that in a little bit here. Now we're going to lay down some release fabric. And as far as I'm concerned, it's not really just a release cloth. It distributes air throughout the whole surface to, so that the plastic isn't up against what you're trying to glue down. So we're flipping the first layer on to the release fabric. Like so, right here. Now. We want to get the thing in the middle of the table, really. We wouldn't want it off to one side. So we're just kind of looking to see. We don't want to push them up against each other because we're going to pick them up individually and glue them. This is the Teak Deccan Systems fitting epoxy, and it's a one-to-one -one mix. So you just dig in, get a nice big flap on there, on there, and um, like so. Oh, it's a sticker. Now you just put two flaps out there about equal size. How's that look? About even? Looks even to me. So now we're just going to force it together here. Listen to it popping. Air bubbles popping in it. You could have a hell of a time mixing that in a pot. So I'm using a stick to mix, but my technique is totally different. I'm pushing at the glue, not pulling at it. I just keep pushing it towards the middle of the pallet and then maybe stirring it up a tiny bit and doing the same thing over and over until the two are entirely mixed together before we start. Now, I would spread it out on the pallet a little bit because I don't want it to create heat because the more heat it creates, the faster you got to go. And you've got five layers of glue here. So, you know, you spread it out and you start picking it up and troweling it onto the a surface and tooth troweling it because if you don't tooth trowel it you get a different amount of glue in every spot you can't do that you have to use a tooth trowel when you're spreading it we're using a tooth trowel now and we're spreading glue on the very edges 
This is the first thing that we have to do. Mm -hmm. And this kind of accounts for why we put the boards kind of a little bit of a distance uh, apart so that we could spread glue on the edges and then just pull the piece mm -hmm. over to the glue. You know, if we wanted to lift a piece, we could do it because we have those spaces, but that's not necessary. I'm just putting a little bit of glue on the last piece here and put it in place so we make sure we get a little glue in the seams. We just don't want them to be dry. The vacuum would probably suck it into those seams anyhow, but I'm just making certain here. That looks pretty good. We'll put that in place. So we put a bar clamp on each end, and the reason is some of the boards have like a tiny edge set in them, maybe only a sixteenth of an inch or something like that, but we do have to pull them together. Two hands on the spreader here. That gets exactly the same amount of glue on it everywhere. And that's exactly what we're trying to do. And that this is getting so much glue that we're only going to put it on one surface. You see, if you do two layers, you'd have glue coming out your ears. Okay. So, we've clamped up the first layer with a bar clamp here just to crowd them up really tightly. And um, we've got glue in between the layers. And now what I'm going to do is just so that if they were sprung a little tiny bit when we crowded it up with the clamps, just crowd the ends together, and I'm going to take a staple gun and drive two staples. That was bad. Try this. I'm going to take a staple gun and drive two staples in the end here to keep it crowded. Then I should be able to take the bar clamp off and see no movement at all, like that. How's that? Now we're going to repeat the process. It's six layers, like I said. It's quite a bit of work. We have to mix in between every time because we couldn't mix enough glue to do it all at once. It would, it would go off on us. We'd have to spread it all over the place. So this is the way to go right here. It's a little bit precarious having to do this mixing in between, but we're getting away with it pretty nice and uh, this is, like I said, uh, a process. It's a process I haven't done before, really, any vacuum bagging. And, and uh, I decided to do it because I didn't want it to be a boarded transom, just like a skip. Because sometimes, even if the uh, lumber is a little bit green, they'll open up a little tiny bit. And people ask me questions about it, but with this one, it's not going to open up, swell or contract or do anything like that. And like I said, it's ultimately strong. We're going to hang some horsepower on this transom right here. Well, we're just about halfway through gluing these laminates up to build this transom. And I'd just like to show you a little bit here. The, um, the, each laminate is laid a little bit biased to the other laminate, so they're not all straight across. That gives you a little bit of diagonal support. But we didn't want to make it like plywood with the layers going uh, 90 degrees to the first layer, so they basically one layer is laid on the angle of the top of the transom, then the next layer is laid on the other angle. I think you can see in here the planking lines going this way here, and these this layer is laid biased to that. How's that? We're going to clamp each layer as we go. We had cut the layers exactly the same size so that the clamp won't foul on the layer beneath it, and it works out really well. I'm going to try to get them across this way. We're just about to set the last piece in place here before we start putting the bag and material over it. And that's it. Now, you can see that we've taped these two pieces up with some packaging tape because we're going to allow these to be taken off afterwards. And um, there's going to be a slot in there for the keel. You can see the layer slide right into position as I tighten the clamp up. Let me have a little bit more. Now I'm just taking that very sharp edge off that top layer so it doesn't cut the bag in any way. Just the corners off. Now it's an inch too long. So all of the staples and everything we've put on the end here is all going to get cut right off. Yeah, it doesn't matter if it's overlapping or anything. All right, we're going to fold it all over. Now I'm just going to Put little spots of glue just because you can't tape this layer. The tape won't stick to it. So what I'm doing is putting a little spots of glue to, so that I can keep this paper towed over there nice and tight. 
Yeah, like that, Lance. There you go. After I folded up the edges on the first release cloth right. and glued it down with a little glue, then we're going to put another layer of release cloth over the top of it, and then a breather cloth on top of that. Yeah, that stay there. Then I fold over the first layer, right over the top of the whole thing. And I'm going to use some two-sided tape in the corners. I have to work with that quite a bit because I'll make like one fold and then put some tape. Or I might make a fold and then unfold it to decide to put some tape in yeah, between. So I've got tape in between all the layers as best as I know how to do it. The next step is to run one right. layer of that double-sided tape all the way around. Now that we've got the corners all sealed up, this is the next thing to do. We'll get that done all the way around, and then we're going to lay a piece of plastic right over the top of the whole thing, and then push the plastic down against the double-edged tape, and just seal it up all the way around. Trim it a little bit around the edge just so we don't have too much excess. I'm cutting it off right at the edge of the tape. So we can, uh, if we had to tape over it, you get a piece of packaging tape on both surfaces. You know what I'm saying? Like right there, you should theoretically, you've got a leak right here. But it might plug itself, you know what I mean? Oh yeah, yeah. Hump or blow. Okay, good. And this is an adjustment. Twenty-five minus twenty-five pounds per square inch. Don't know how the adjustment works, but okay. All right. Now we're going to cut a hole in the top layer of plastic, and we're going to slip a hose in there, a vacuum hose. We're going to seal that all up with that double-edged tape because we don't want that leaking either. And then we're going to go all the way around the edge looking for what we might think are possibly leaks. It's kind of hard to hear a vacuum leak, but uh, we're going to do the best we can to make sure it's all sealed up properly. And what we're looking for here is 15 pounds of vacuum per square inch. That would be one atmosphere, really. And uh, that's enough to clamp it right down really tight, real tight. We would have to put a clamp on every square inch to attain this type of pressure. So we're sucking the volume of air out of the bag right now, and we're down to a probably five or six pounds of vacuum at this point and it's going to come up to 15 pounds of vacuum per square inch and that's one atmosphere and uh, it, it, what it means it's putting 15 pounds of pressure for every square inch of surface area that you see here it also puts 15 pounds of pressure per square inch around the edges which applies a pressure in this direction to crowd the boards together nice and tight and of course it's going to suck all the volume of air out of the glue lines and everything else and some of the glue up through the seams, and it is going to be so tight that um, when we remove that bag tomorrow, it's going to be on there overnight, but when we remove it, this thing is going to be one solid piece of wood. So we've removed the vacuum bagging material and taken it up off, off the floor and put it up on a couple of sawhorses here, and i just like to say to you again that this is six layers of about 7 16 inch white oak vacuum bag together. This layer that you see right here is straight across the transom, the next layer down's got a little bias to it like that, very little. Next one's got a little bias to it like that. So what's happening is you've got kind of a crisscross effect in here, but in effect, all the grain is going across. There's no grain in here. I haven't put any layers in here that go vertical. So all of it is a thwart chips, but it's slightly angled to each other. So it creates a tremendous strength and not an ability to resist splitting. And that's what that's all about. That's why I've done it. And uh, I like it. This is going to be the inside. I like to see uh, uh, the appearance of it looking like it's boards and not just disappear. And you can see that this is a little bit of quartered grain in here, a little bit of slab sort of grain in here. So it changes its character as it goes down. And uh, it's about six feet across at the chines and about 30 inches tall. So the next thing I'd like to do is just give you a quick visual on what this thing is going to look like with a finish on it. And this is just some denatured alcohol. How's that look? All right, so now we're at the starboard side of the transom, and I, like I say, I've cut this off, but I've only cut about a quarter of an inch of it off just to get rid of the staples and give it a quick look, and I'm going to cut another inch of it off, but you can see now how tight the laminates are to each other, and like I said, this laminate is quarter sawn here, right? 
and then you've got slab sawn section. So it's a mix of corded and slabbed, which gives it a nice strength. So you can see how tight it is here on the starboard end of the transom on most of the laminates. And uh, there is a little tiniest bit of space up in here, but that's because of the nibbing where it came out of the planer. So what's going to happen is we cut another inch of it off, and the entire thing will look exactly like this, just as tight as can possibly be. And here it is again. This is some slab sawn material right in here, and this is quarter sawn material, slab sawn, quartered. So you've got a mix of slab sawn and quarter sawn. It gives it a nice appearance. And I think it just adds to the strength. Well, here is our transom for the 23-footer set up right here on the proper angle. The whole setup has been figured out already. We got a couple of molds to put up, but uh, this transom is what we're concerned about. It is really built. It's solid. It's heavy, man, and it's strong. And that's the idea. We want it to be really strong because it's going to be holding some horsepower. It's an outboard-powered boat. It'll be cut out like this for an outboard motor. Whether or not it's got a 25-inch shaft or a 20-inch shaft, we are, it's probably going to have a 25-inch shaft. So, you know, it's, uh, it's quite a piece right there. The whole boat is really going to be fun for us. We're in a new spot right now to build it, and uh, it's just been something we've been looking forward to. So I wanted to show you this tool again here. This tool, we asked people about what they might call it and what people thought it was. And we got tremendous response on it. It was really something else. A lot of people called it a spud, which is for stripping bark. But a spud, to me, is quite a bit narrower than this. And it's got like a little hooked end on it for kind of continuing around the bark when you're peeling them. So it's not a spud. Bob Gould was the first guy that came up with the proper name for it as far as I'm concerned. It's a shipbuilder's slice is what it is. A, a slick is narrower and a slice, it's made for different purposes. It's heavy, so you can use it with momentum, kind of like an adze, and you can also push it to slice things, you know, to pare things down. So, you know, it's, uh, it's quite a tool. I use it quite a bit, and uh, it's fun. It's fun to have. I can't remember exactly where I got it, but I'm glad I did, so. People came up with a million different names for it. It's incredible. I, I can hardly believe it. So, you know, that's, uh, that's what we've done with that. But back to our 23-footer, next week we're going to steal some more measurements from the model to make the first two molds that we have to make, or the only two molds, and get those set up, and maybe get the stem set up as well. We have to set up a staging around it so we can work at this height because we're going to be putting the sole across the two chines first. So it's going to be pretty interesting. It's going to be built a lot differently than any boat that I've ever built. Uh, it's going to incorporate some different things that we used to do in skiffs, the old man's method, and hang over and cut off. All of those kinds of things will happen on this boat right here. So we're pretty happy about it, and we're ready to go.